OTBs, the hurling pod. With Board Gosh Energy. Hurling, it's anyone's game. Welcome along to the Hurling Pod. We're looking forward to the two provincial finals this coming weekend. They're a repeat of last year's finals. Limerick will be up against Clare at the Gaelic Grounds. We'll talk about that being the venue in a moment. And at Croke Park at 4 o'clock on Sunday, the Munster final at 1.45, Leinster final at 4. You've got a repeat of last year's decider, Kilkenny against Galway. So... What better than having a Kilkenny man and a Galway man here to look ahead to the two finals and to chat about the weekend just gone by. Paul Murphy, James Skell, how are you getting on, lads? How's it going, lads? How's it going? Um, thank you, Skell, for joining us. I would have understood entirely. We're recording this on Monday lunchtime at the moment. The video will be up a little bit later on. It'll be available on podcast probably just after we finish this. Um, not an easy thing to do after yesterday, losing out the final. I mean, there's not me digging at you. It was a hard day for me, too, with Offie losing the cork in the final. But uh, you're here with us, at least. Yeah, as that's as your you're two very important people in my life, Les. I couldn't let you down. <laughs> <laughs> you're obviously still drunk in there. Huh? <laughs> you're still drunk then coming out with statements like that. Oh gosh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I, I just think I'm getting more I, I'm getting more uh, refined in my old age now, Murphy. You know? <laughs> I know, but you're right, really, like it was a tough day yesterday and um I suppose it was uh, it was a disappointing way to finish the year, obviously. We didn't get uh, the performance we were expecting or hoping to get. Mm-hmm. So uh, we lost out to a good clear team. So look at all you can do is move, move on. Onwards and upwards. Yeah, I mean, look, you were keen last week to not talk about the final. You were kind of keeping the head down. We were on the pod. I was kind of half joking. You know, talk to us a little bit about this. And you were like, that's the only statement. We'll talk about the final next week. And <laughs> then I saw Pat Nolan's tweet which went up last night. And he was talking about just the scale of Clare's achievements. So your Galway team this year, Scale, had averaged victories of 16 points. And no team had been closer than 11 points during your Leinster campaign or in the semi-final win. And obviously, Claire turned you over in the final. So mm-hmm. I don't mean to phrase it in what went wrong, but maybe what did Claire do right that maybe the other teams that played you this year didn't do? I think I think to be honest, like you can have all you know, you can you can prepare as much as you can. You can prepare with drills and analysis and te- you, you name it. You can do any amount of preparation, S and C, etc. But you can't be prepared for you know the final. You know, whether it be pre match nerves, whether it be you know anxiety, anticipation, or and so you're only hoping that when the game starts that like you. you it's the, the lads are filled with kind of, I suppose, passion, aggression, all the things that would complement their skills, you know. And just we, we were a bit flat yesterday, really, really flat. And I suppose in the first half specifically, like we were, they they won all the breaks. I, I, I won't say most of them, they won nearly all of them. Um, they just we had an awful lot of opportunities missed. Now, granted, we got a couple of goals which which probably flattered the scoreline at halftime. We should have been way further ahead if you ask me because we had eight or nine wides that we would consider shootable, you know, shootable that, that we would expect the lads to score. Lads that don't you know, have that ability. Um, and there was a bit of a breeze behind us, so we thought like we'd get in at halftime and just kind of, you know, set the tone a bit and then conceding the goals early in the second half put us back a bit. And it's just like, you know, so be it. Like we just, what happened is Claire got her run in and it's very hard to stop a run. And when we would claw our way back and let's say get a goal or get a couple of points, they'd win a free or, you know, they'd do something that, that would kind of nullify our big moment, you know. And then we couldn't get, we just couldn't claw back. And ultimately, then all the players then were, they were elevated, their performances were elevated, and they started shooting scores from 60, 70 yards. Huge scores for them as players and also for the crowd. And then just, it was, the wheel was turning at that stage, Will, and it was very hard to stop. So yeah. I just think we were, we were flat. We were just flat and we didn't perform. But ultimately, Claire came with loads of aggression, energy, and were full, fully observing the victory. Yeah, like I thought Owen Gunning was incredibly, got manned the match from corner back for Claire. And mm-hmm. so many times he, came out with the ball against the Galway forward line. Your forwards have been on fire really all year. And then yesterday, he seemed to always just be in the right place at the right time. But maybe the frustration would be that when you know they've got a defender that's that good, you probably should have kept the ball away from him. Yeah, well, I suppose, yeah. Like, I, <clears throat> like, I, I have great confidence in our forwards too. But mm. I think he's, um, from looking at him now up close, like obviously we would have studied, him on, studied them, should I say, on 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 screen, but he's very kind of Ollie Canning-esque, if you know what I mean. So what he does, he's a very good reader of the ball. So like you'd be watching the game and if you weren't looking at him closely, you'd say, how is he out in front the whole time? You know, but he's he's nearly, I won't say our striking or deliveries were telegraphed, but he, as soon as I were to say wing forwards or midfield were, sh- were shooting diagonal balls, he was t- stealing a couple of steps in our forwards and he's coming out then. He's got a good touch, he's fast. So like once you kind of piece all them things together, like a good reader, good touch, fast, all you have is a cornerback that's coming steaming. Like, you know, he was a good reader, um, and a good defender. Like, I know everyone says with, with ball in hand, he's fantastic, but he's also a very good defender. He's a good player, like, and he's he's um, he's one for the future for Clare. Like, he'll obviously he'll fill out, he'll grow, you know, etc. And uh, he'd probably be again current trajectory. He could be a mainstay in Clare in a few years' time. 
Mm. Murph, I think you have to give a lot of credit to Claire here with the way development has changed as well because it was only a couple of seasons ago that we saw, I think it was 626 that Cork had scored against them oh. and you know, Claire had had a bad run at the underage and everything seemed to be going wrong off the field at the same time and it felt like kind of crisis point for the county and now here they are picking up their second All-Ireland minor title in what's a fairly short period of time since that actual, what felt like in Adir a few years ago. Yeah, it's great and it's great for the county in general. Like obviously, I suppose your flagship team of the senior team, you want to be going well and they are going well. Um, but you're always, I suppose, keeping one eye over the shoulder and seeing what's coming through, what's going to feed into that over the few years. And when you're able to, you don't necessarily have to go and win these, um, as, let's say, as close together as they have, but you certainly want to be keeping them ticking over. Like that's what every county wants to do is, you know, get an All-Ireland at underage, be it minor, under 20, and keep them in relatively close, I suppose, proximity to each other over a couple of years. That's the sign that, you know, the conveyor belt is working. You know, there's players coming through. It's encouraging for the future. Um, and like that's something that Claire have managed to do. And like you said, you know, a few years ago, there was a few indications that maybe things aren't going the right direction. So, you know, kudos to Claire for doing it. And I think a lot of counties as well will also take um, a lot of encouragement from the likes of Claire and from the likes of Offaly. Like, you know, you see that, OK, you can maybe head to a place where no county wants to go, but then with a bit of hard work, steadying the ship, getting few people involved and I suppose having a strategic plan, essentially really what's the long game here. Um, you can see how counties can turn it around, you know, and I think a lot of counties have learned also over maybe the last kind of 20 years since really development squads and, and things have been implemented in counties, 20, 30 years, let's say, that um, people kind of realise the longer game. Like, you know, just because something is working now, let's say, for example, Limerick are winning all Ireland at the moment, but like, you know, you could let it go stagnant very quickly. And then when it goes stagnant, it takes five or six years to turn it around. So it, it, it's great for Clare. It's good times for Clare at the moment. And looking forward to a Munster final to have the victory over the weekend in Not Ireland. It's, it's brilliant, you know. So I'm sure um, as a whole, look, Clare are in a good place at the moment. Um, and it's, uh, I think a lot of counties would take, I suppose, a small bit of hope for themselves that if, if, if your own individual county isn't in a great place, all you have to do is look to Clare and say, well, look, they turned it around in a relatively short period of time. Mm. James, you've been look fairly, I guess, back and forth with Clare fans. Might be the fair way to put it over the last couple of years. Um, did any of them come up to you on the pitch afterwards? Because like the pitch was obviously mobbed with Clare supporters. You would have been out around the middle of the field. Were there any choice conversations with Clare supporters you may have met online over in, the last two in, years? In fairness to them all, um, let's see. People kind of first of all, we didn't expect them to come out to the pitch, but I suppose it's very hard to hold them. You know, they're like cattle trying to get out of a shed, so they were. <laughs> I think there was Plan B sign up and Torres as well, but. Um, no, in fairness, we uh, they were very good. They all, they, they, they a lot of people come over, not just the players now or management, but the supporters mm. in general, and just said, love the pod. It was great. You know what I mean? It's, it's a balanced debate. You get the odd choice word, right, yeah? One guy comes to me and says, why am I so hard and clear? It's like, what are you talking about? Like, not so hard and clear. <laughs> you go out my sight. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, well, uh, I, I would say probably yesterday I was approached by, um, I'm going to say about 50 people. Okay. Between, between a pre- uh, after the match on the on the pitch and then walking out, uh, and that, that was clear. Size. Go on. Awfully cork, you know, there's, there's an awful lot of people, etc. Um, but I'd say of the 50, 48 were, were very, very positive, you know. So, and but the two that weren't very positive was were from Claire, right? Yeah, <laughs> I, hope, I hope by the way that was pre game because I really hope it wasn't someone to go over to, to commiserate with you and then they give out and go, Do you know what, you weren't fair about Claire a few pods ago. No, it was post game, two or post game. Ah, right? ah, yeah, that's bad. But, there, but come here, let's let's, let's let's you have that in every. I presume there's a lot of people in the same way. Do you know what I mean? But just mm. it's mm. it's like you're going to get them in every single county, every club, every parish, whatever you want to call it. So that's to be expected. I suppose when you when you put yourself uh, on a platform to provide an opinion, sometimes people don't agree with it. Obviously, so mm. and I, I, I welcome that. I love people coming to me face to face and let's have a debate. You know. So then when I asked the per- one clear person, like, and he was, I hopefully now if he's listening, he's probably in his fifties. You know what I mean? So like he's he's seen a good bit of her in his time, I'd imagine. And he said, why are you so hard and clear? And I said, explain to me why I'm hard and clear. Tell me now, what, what, what have I said? And he couldn't answer me. <laughs> he couldn't answer me. Like, so I just, he was, well, 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 you're always going against them. I said, Is, I'm not like, I'm not always going against them. What are you talking about? You know, like I said, who's going to win now next week? And he goes, we are. And I said, explain to me how you're going to win. We just are. <laughs> not, not to remind you but I believe the Leinster final preview we did last year I asked you that very same question when you went where are we going to beat Kenny and you said because I really 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 want them to win <laughs> really? exact same logic as you actually you have a very good memory my friend that's exactly what I said because I just <laughs> really hope they win it yeah. and you're going to get the same answer to today as well 
that's that's a bit of a spoiler for a few minutes yeah. time maybe. Um, I've been beating this drum for a while though Skell I thought yesterday was a fantastic occasion and look maybe it was enhanced by having two counties who've had a lot of success at the levels in Galway and Cork and Clare and Offaly who were very hungry for success so therefore loads of people travelled and it was a great yeah. day and it was a bank holiday weekend but I still think if it's possible next year I really like the idea of these two finals being combined together as a showcase. Have them both in TG Car, same venue. Maybe Sample Stadium could be the defined venue for it, say, every year. I know yeah. it's close to the Leaving Cert, but it made for a magnificent day yesterday. Like, I, it was electric now. First of all, the day was, the day was lovely. Uh, so someone was obviously out. Um, there was a real buzz around Thurles. You know, there was, obviously, when you come into Thurles from the Galway side, like, there's a big, long straight coming in. And there was cars parked, like we were saying, we were commenting, like they were way out. I mean, like you, so you, you, you could expect there was going to be a big crowd. And I actually commented, and we went out to the pitch just for a walk around just to assess the ground. And I said, Jesus, they're awfully playing first. <laughs> I said, because the place was was awash with awfully. You know what I mean? They're getting the best seats. And in fairness, they're, they're like roughly are a rap, and Claire combined, yeah, they're a rapturous crowd. And I was trying to actually, I was having a discussion with a person last night about why is that? Like, how come you've got counties like the Clares, the Offaly's? Um, you know, at times Waterford, who are so they're boisterous, they're rapturous, they're really energetic. And again, we, we struggled. To, I suppose Galway have been spoilt at underage level, and I think probably there's that. You know, we're, we're nearly expecting. I think that the Galway as a people are nearly expecting to come home with a minor every every couple of years. So maybe the importance is not exactly placing that too highly in comparison to senior. Whereas clear, I, I if I'm not mistaken, that's their second All Ireland, is it? It is, yeah. Great. So like they're. With the quarter vote, they're, they're, they were starved of success with that grade, I see. So you can see why everyone would come behind them. And judging by the fact that obviously the 20s got knocked out by Cork and the seniors weren't playing for another week, we were saying there's going to be a good clear crowd, and there was. You know, And the same with Offaly. Like Offaly year, I don't know, I actually can't remember when Offaly won them 20s last, or 21, rather. Never the, never won it. Never, it's, never, the one, it's the one they've never won. Sorry, um, I, didn't, I didn't mean to know. I didn't, I didn't know. <laughs> no, <laughs> I, no. I didn't it, yeah. But like again, you can see the energy that the crowd providing. And it's like, it's less, we, we waited for a few minutes and you can hear... Like when Screeny gets the ball, Jesus, like the place, <laughs> awfully people just go nuts. And he usually gives them something to shout about, you know. But a uh, great day. I agree with you. I, I think it was, even for the kids themselves, I know I keep saying kids, for the young lads themselves, mm-hmm. like it was probably one of the experiences they'll take with them with, through, with them through the rest of their life. Regardless if they play, you know, 20 senior, et cetera, and move on. But what they witnessed yesterday and got to be part of, like was was fabulous. So, so I think the GA, they, they'd miss a trick if they didn't do that now. They should keep it together, if you ask me. Yeah, under 20 final, which followed. So Cork have now won three of the last four at that level. And we've seen how many players they've mixed into their senior team over the last couple of seasons and the amount of players they used that were quite young uh, this year. Some of them, like Owen Downey, were playing in the final yesterday. And it turns out it's going to be Ben O'Connor's last game of hurling for quite some time. He's going to go into the Munster Academy. So uh, he confirmed after the game that he's finished with hurling for now. He's going to be a big loss because he came out with a tremendous amount of ball yesterday. And he is an incredible um, athlete uh, with the way that he covers ground as well uh, Cunningham incredible scorer uh, top scorer from play throughout the championship and I think just behind Screeny on um, <laughs> scores Cork were, were generally very dominant I think after the final quarter you mentioned Skell every time the ball came into to Screeny in the opening 15-20 minutes he seemed mm. to skin his man and often were very good at running at them and looked like maybe it was going to be an underdog's day up until that point and then Cork kind of wrestled control got ahead by a couple of points at half time it was one eleven, one nine. And they banged Offaly for 1-4 just after half time, And I think the result looked reasonably academic after that. Uh, Cork were very much on top, I felt. Offaly got the strong finish to the game, scored the goal. Uh, there was probably nearly more of their supporters on the pitch than Cork supporters on the pitch at full time, which is a little bit crazy. But that's maybe the nature of uh, this Offaly team. So I think Cork were, first of all, very, very worthy winners. But the thing, Murph, that uh, probably has come up afterwards is that Leo O'Connor, the Offaly manager, was complaining about the cynical fouling. And there's no doubt Cork were sharing the fouls among them in the first 15, 20 minutes to maybe get through that spell where Offaly were hurling quite well. But the one that's obviously come up, and Brian Gavin, who, you know, full disclosure, is an Offaly man writing the Irish Examiner in his referee piece, which comes out every week. So you can see the clip on screen at the moment if you're on our YouTube. He says, quote, for what I believe is at least the fifth time across this year's hurling championship, a blatant red card was missed when Cormac Egan was shoulder to the head by Shane Kingston as he threatened the court goal. As a referee and a follower of hurling, I love the shoulder to shoulder, hip to hip play. I was always in favour of physical play, but Kingston was late and referee Chris Mooney failed in not giving him his marching orders for a dangerous foul. Egan was unable to see out the game as a result, so he went off at half time. Uh, he paid the price for what was done to him and Kingston didn't. As we have seen in the senior championship, referees have let themselves down in not taking the duty of care for the player into consideration, but the very rule too. 
Um, this has come up a few times, Murph. I mean, it was on the Sunday game only three weekends ago where they were looking at some of the head-high tackles and how referees should be clamping down on it. And no red card produced yesterday. Yeah, and it, you couldn't had more of a clean-cut example of it because it's kind of one of those ones. Some can be deceptive when players are passing each other, but um, I think from any angle, that was just nailed on as to what was after happening. That it was a high tackle straight to the head. I think there's two arguments here. Obviously, the first and the foremost one is just the player welfare like that. You know, we're, we're, every other sport is, is uh, has rules in place and respects it, particularly rugby. It's the one we always point to say that, look what they're... And even at underage now in rugby... If I'm right in saying, I think they've changed the height of the legitimate tackle. I think it's below the sternum or something like that now. I think I heard something about that lately anyway. Could be wrong. Yeah, no, basically what's happened is World Rugby are trying to get a position where, yeah, the target area is going to change to uh, officially, as you say, bring it down a bit so people aren't trying mm. to hit around shoulder level now. Yeah, so they're even taking it not just a hit to the head. They're saying, okay, let's have room for error here, whereby if, if, if a, let's say a player aims for the stomach and he hits the chest, well, at least you're still not hitting the head in that error. But, you know, with the hurling at the moment, the two things that I find kind of are, are the crux of it is, one, yeah, player welfare. I mean, there's players getting hit in the head and we see players now not continuing matches because they've got serious injuries and we see players not even getting yellow cards for, for, for some of the incidents. Um, but the second one for me uh, is the frustration I think the players feel because we're going to see someone now, I think, before the end of the senior championship getting a red card for a high tackle. But it's been so frustrating for that team that gets it if they do get it because they'll have seen 10 examples of where another players weren't sent off and suddenly now there'll be an enormous clampdown or a referee now i'm not saying the referee will be wrong in doing it but if you look back to the joe mcdonough final mm -hmm. and the often player getting sent off for pulling the face guard how many other face guards were pulled during the year where a player wasn't sent off and i would feel that player like the frustration you must have felt of going okay yeah absolutely that's the rule it's a red card but when it's not enforced really well <clears throat> frustration creeps in in players then and i just i would hate like for i think the rule you know should be enforced absolutely to protect players but i cannot i can see it happening where someone is going to get absolutely clamped down on for a moderate enough tackle because referees will start clamping down on this really harsh and teams will get very frustrated then because it'll go from one extreme to the other. But I do, like, I mean, I'm not saying that I don't want to see it clamped down on. I do want to see it clamped down. But it's the inconsistency in it. It's just, it's just remarkable. And um, look, I just think we're not setting a good example. Like Skettle was saying there, that weekend, yesterday was an incredible day in Turles. And one of the main talking points coming out of it is one of our young up-and-coming players um, receiving a head-high tackle. And we didn't show the example of, you know, this is this is not what we're about and clamping down and, and giving a red card. So it's just, it's 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 rambling on. This this debate is rambling on. It won't be the last we hear of it, but hopefully I'd like to see the end of it happen fairly soon, whereby, you know, players are, I suppose, feeling the repercussions of a high tackle. And at least then we get it into the culture whereby it's, it's just not acceptable anymore. Yeah. James, I think there's probably two sides to this. So on the one hand, I actually would agree with some of the Cork supporters who were saying afterwards that they actually liked that little bit of cynicism from their defenders, whereby they realised they had a bit of an issue, Screeny particularly running at them. And so if that means that the defender has to take a free to make sure that he doesn't get a run in on goal, that's maybe that little bit of edge that Cork teams have been accused of in recent years of not having, that they're almost too nice. And in this case, it was a final. They realised they were in a sticky patch within the final. They were able to ride it out. And if it meant they gave away a few frees and that the opposition got frustrated, so be it. And if it meant going up and getting physical in lad's face, that's kind of part of the game. On the other hand, on the Judy Care side, what's your take on the fact that the referees didn't produce a red card there? I think Cork would have went on and won anyway. I think that's how dominant they were after the first uh, quarter, that even a man short they would have won. But it could potentially have had a big impact on the game if a red card had been brandished along with the penalty there. Yeah, I think no doubt. Have it. Straight away, if you're a man down, especially a defender as prominent as the fullback, you're saying to yourself, there'd be a bit of a, bit of a shift, you could say, in, in the Cork um, team. But I would look at that now and I'd be saying to myself, like, did the ref, did he actually converse with everyone? Did he take every available option or resource open to him? Like, did he, did he, and I, I don't know, right? Was he mic'd up to the, the linesman, which he generally is? Did he ask them? Did he go to the umpires? I'd be very disappointed in the umpires, I have to say this, because that's... Well, he, sp he spoke to his umpires, so they yeah, obviously which had I saw, input. I saw that. Yeah. Which I, why is that's exactly why I'm be disappointed because, like, is that is that is that incident ten yards away from the goals? Is it less? It's, it's inside it's the box, obviously. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. just outside five the box, or six yeah. yards. So like, it's as, it's as clear and concise a case as you can possibly develop, right? And it's there. 
And like obviously Screeny got hit as well. I think the clip is obviously dominated by Cormac. He can get his hit, but when Screen lays the ball, he gets hit also. And I'd be disappointed that as as a collective, call it a, 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 an official collective, that they didn't send him off. You know. But again, like when we talk about defenses and big defenses, like good good defensive teams, like you know, there's that element of. I use the word now in the best possible manner, nastiness about them. You know, that there's cynicism is the word you'd use, Will, right? But there's a mm. bit of a bit of bite about them, a bit of bonus, right? If you if you like, okay. And if you've got players who are as important to the opposition's cause, like Adam Screeny, you're going to have to get in his face. You have to. You can't you can't allow him the freedom of the park because he'll damage it. We've obviously seen he'll shoot from anywhere and he'll score it, you know. So like I, I like that about Cork that they, they got physical because they were big boys at Cork. There was, I thought there was a vast difference now in the physical development, obviously, because the age, don't get me wrong. Of Cork, awfully. I just think they used an awful lot yesterday. They used it both in defence and attack. They got an awful lot of freeze by running through awfully lads that just couldn't couldn't stop them yet, you know. Um, so I think Cork are on a they're on a great track. As you were saying, there with the three out of the four All Irelands. Yeah, it's like it's yeah. a kind of an unending production line now at the moment, and a good few of them are going through to the senior panel as well. You know, sometimes this doesn't happen. Sometimes you win and you only get one off the team. But a nice few of those lads over the last three years have actually got a bit of senior experience now. Yeah, and there's more to come. Like, I suppose the last one that I can think of was, you remember the Limerick 3 in a row back in 21, <clears throat> late mm. 99, early 2000s? Yeah, mm. they didn't get enough, they didn't get the success. That, that, that didn't translate into senior level. You know, so like, you'd be, you, from a car perspective, you'd be hoping for them that they take those four teams and they put them in senior level and try try establish, a, you know, a good base of player for 10 years in seniors. Because I think with the way they're going now and the positivity surrounding the county, although they're all the champs, don't get me wrong, especially I'm talking about youth, like they're they could be a dominant force, you know. If they because the players, the, the players, how do I say this now? Sometimes you look at underage teams, all the players look the same. You know, you've got your small little forwards, some they are back, but all the cork boys seem to be even go back to the last couple of years, physically big men who can move and hurl. You know, so when you mix those couple of attributes in the player, where he's physical, he's athletic, he can hurl, skill based, and a touch and essence, if you want to call it that, like you've got a dangerous animal there. And so that's that's for, for a cork perspective, the future is definitely, definitely bright. Yeah, I know. And I think, look, winning does no harm either from their point of view. You get that kind of winning mentality, which they'll now uh, carry into the senior panel in the next few years as well. So um, Cork and Clare, it was an all Munster day in terms of the success at Temple Stadium yesterday. Looking ahead to the games this weekend, we might start with the Munster final, lads. It's first up of the weekend at the Gaelic Grounds, Murph, which there was a nice bit of back and forth over, I think, an evening meet initially with Munster Council and then a morning meeting the day afterwards last week on the Tuesday. And eventually the decision was made that it was going to the Gaelic grounds. So Limerick were happy enough to go to Porky Cueve. Clare wanted the game to be in Semple Stadium. And in the end, it ends up being a home game for Limerick. I don't know. If you're a Clare player, would you be happy about this? Well, I suppose, um, like, uh, yeah, I was thinking about it because I was, I was very surprised when I heard the Clare supporters really happy. Like, obviously, from um a location point of view like they're only down the road uh, for a lot of them it was really convenient absolutely but that's not really the biggest um biggest thing you're thinking about when you're you're trying to have your team in the best position they can to win the match but having said that that's where they bet them a few weeks ago you know mm-hmm. um i think it's i i think it's a big marker for Claire sitting down the stall basically saying that it's kind of a, a, a mental battle there where they're saying, we'll, we'll come down and play in the gaelic crowns like i know it's a convenience thing but from the limb from the Clare team point of view from Brian Lowen's camp I think they're looking at going we'll go down and we fully believe that we can beat you and it doesn't matter whether it's in the Gaelic crowns or whether it's in Turles um, we'll go and we'll play in the Gaelic crowns we'll have no excuses and that's what we're you know we're going to win a monster final in the Gaelic crowns and I think for a mental preparation point of view you know when I first heard it I was saying well, why do they want to go there like you know but then afterwards I was saying do you know what it's nearly like not to say it's a double bluff but it's like Brian Lowen basically saying to lads like tuning their heads right in. We're going back down to the scene of the crime from a few weeks ago and we're going to do it twice. That's basically what we're going to do. We fully believe we can do it down there. It doesn't matter whether it's Ennis or it's Turles or Scaly Crowns. We're, we're going to go play them in their own home pitch and we're going to beat them. So I was kind of thinking, Jesus, maybe this he's playing chess. We're all playing checkers. <laughs> maybe this is what it is. But look, I think it's a great venue for it. Brilliant venue for it. Like, um, and like, should we see the ticket sales? I mean, it's absolutely incredible. Like the monster finals over the last few years, just the interest and, you know, the carnival atmosphere that it brings. Um, it's, it's just going to be brilliant. And it, I, I think it's great that we're not having a, a fiasco that's dragging on either, where it's, uh, if it wasn't Parky Cueve and Claire weren't happy, we'd still be talking about it now and it'd be dragging on and it'd be probably casting a shadow over the situation. So it's brilliant that both sides are happy. We're going to the Gaelic grounds, fantastic venue. And now we can just talk about hurling and the run into the final. What do you reckon, Skell? 
I, I understand what Murph is saying. I, I understand exactly where he's coming from in that kind of they're developing, a, I suppose, a siege mentality collectively as a group and as a, even as a, as, a, as a public and clear. Um, now, saying we're going back down to Limerick and we're going to take them on in their own backyard again, it's grand saying it. Doing it is way different. <laughs> Doing it is a, is a different kettle of fish entirely. And I understand it's a monster final, so the, the split will likely be 50 50 in terms of you know um, attendances between counties, but still, as to rock into Limerick and to beat them once in, your, in their own patch is one thing, but to beat them twice, mm. that's a tricky proposition. Now, I don't think that's, that's going to phase Clare at all. I just think Clare are, are very, very confident at the moment. Everyone, players and the sports alike, they're, they're confident and they've every right to be. But I'd be looking for, if I can get any advantage at all, whether it be a 1% or a 2%, or I'm taking it. So that's why I was very surprised by how they agreed uh, to go into the late grounds. I thought, like, go down to Cork, go down to Thurles, you know, and, and try and have it as 11 playing field because, like, I, I wouldn't be given an opposition who are as strong as Limerick any foot up at all. You know, I'd be trying to take everything away from them as possible. And mm-hmm. that should be make, make their crowd travel to Cork as long as Clare are going to travel, anyways. Like, if they played abroad in Iron Islands, Clare would pack the place, you know. So it's, it's as simple as that, you know. But um, now, different proposition. And, but like that, as, as Mark was saying, like that, that's, that's, the, that's evident. You know, you know how some, some players or some teams, excuse me, nearly epitomize the, the, the persona of the manager. And you, you watch the way Lohan goes up and down the line. I have that feeling about Clare now, you know, that Lohan is always up and down, nearly grunting as he's going up and down the line, like he's ready for battle himself. Like if he threw on the red, you wouldn't be surprised if he threw on the red helmet himself and went in. He's that kind of way about him. And I just think the Clare team now epitomize his like he just like he, I suppose his attitude his persona so he doesn't care like he never cared, cared in his own hurling days so I'd imagine he's transferring that message or that persona into the team and they're going to prep it again for Sunday so if we're, whatever like we're in for we're in for hot treatments because the, the atmosphere last week uh, when Limerick played Cork was electric as well so that's mm-hmm. just going to be uh, uh, another one so it's great look forward to it I, yeah. I think as well though just like what you're saying there's I agree but like if you were looking uh, for uh, at Brian Lowe and preparing for this game like they haven't bet him in Turles. They haven't bet him in Cork. So why not play on the ground that they did beat them in? And like that's only a few weeks ago, whereby a lot of these players, like th- that memory is fresh. Like, you know, it's tangible memory that th- those lads have. And so when you're, you know, you think you're running up for the week into a Munster final or Leinster final, or whatever it is, all week you're in work or whatever, you're thinking back and you're drumming up all the memories of different matches and stuff. And you're like, geez, wouldn't it be great there now the final whistle getting back. The one thing they're thinking about is that memory that's only six weeks ago, that or whatever it was, you know, that they're going, Jesus, was not an unbelievable night. Like, and it was just incredible. They still have that, like that, that feeling is still in that dressing room. So after thinking about it, I, I was on your mindset there absolutely last week. But then when I kind of came around to it, I was thinking, do you know <clears> what, <throat> actually, I, I, can't, I, I understand. I understand where they're coming from, like, you know, as in, and, and maybe they're also putting it to the fact that maybe it might be a bit of doubt from Limerick's point because, you know, Gaelic Grounds is a fortress to an extent, but is there a 1% or 2%, not a bit of doubt there, not saying that, but where Limerick go, well, they have turned us over here, like, they have turned us over, whereas they haven't turned us over in Turles, haven't turned us over in Parky Cueve, but this is the ground they've turned us over, and is there something to that? So... I don't know. It's like I was saying, I just think it's a kind of a, it's, it's almost like not a double bluff if there's a better version of that where it's just, you know, they're saying, do you know what, let's just go back here and um, relive what we relived a few weeks ago. Maybe maybe that's you. what it is. But you know? Do you think, let's say, if you rewind back, let's say, whatever period of time, six, seven weeks, you said, Mark, when Clare played Limerick, I think, like, outside of Clare, I don't think anyone expects them to beat Limerick at the time. No, no. Truth no, no. I, I no. thought it didn't anyway. I thought, I thought because off the back of the temporary performance, I was saying, I think Limerick could t- top, top these lads by six, seven points. So I think where Limerick were starting from, maybe, I'm not saying the seat in them either, don't get me wrong, but I'm saying from where they're starting from then to the and care produced performance to where they are now, like Limerick have been warned and warned heavily. Mm. And so I just think, you know, they know what's coming down the tracks here. So Limerick are yeah. prepped for a great rock. Absolutely. Own, yeah. Their own home stadium. So I'm just thinking our, our, the journey of both teams has been obviously way different, you know. Um, mm. And I just think Limerick now, they're. They're slowly turning the wheel back again, lads. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that, that, yeah. That, car, that, that car performance, albeit the margin was very tight, was very, very impressive, and that's why I'd say get them out of Limerick, <laughs> get them out yeah. of there quickly, you know, quickly. But yeah, look, so be it. Let's rock. Uh, more than two hundred sixty thousand tickets were sold across the Munster Championship round robin. Yeah. I don't think the Munster Championship's ever been hotter than it is right now, and 
Ticketmaster went down for a lot of people. I think there were lots of frustrated people when the tickets went on sale for the Munster final. They were in the queue and couldn't get them, or they were sitting in a shop and the shop was trying to connect to the system and the tickets were all gone. Such was the speed they went with that lunchtime last week. So um, it is the hottest ticket in town this weekend. And Murph, we were just saying earlier, and this isn't to make a. I'm not trying to do a direct hurling versus football comparison here, but even watching the Sunday game last night, I was very struck at when you look at the multiple games where there were very small attendance at the weekend. And Look, I accept entirely that it's a bank holiday weekend, so there are plenty of people away. 25 quid is expensive if you're going to one of the group games in the All-Ireland Senior Football Championship, but it's not capturing the hearts and mind in the same way that the Hurling Championship has this year, particularly Munster, where we've had so many of these games at either sell-out or close to sell-out, and sometimes weeks in advance that uh, quite a few of the tickets were already gone. Yeah, um, and like even in Kilkenny at the weekend, um, we had Dublin and Kildare playing. And I expected, like Dublin played Leash in Nolan Park, I think around 2016. I think that brought about 20, 22,000 people potentially. It was pretty much a sellout. Um, and I think we were expecting the same thing down in Kilkenny. And I think 8,000 people came to the game. So, like, there was, you know, there was a few jerseys around, all right, but not to the level we expected. And I think it all just comes back to competition and the balance of how um quick the matches are coming like monster championship is really at a sweet spot like it has savage competition incredible competition and every team feels like they're in with a shout of winning it and everybody wants to go and win it and then the games are spread out to a nice enough distance where it's not they're coming thick and fast they are in one way for us certainly because you know we're following all teams but there's a nice few weeks in between where you're, you're not on the road like you know eight weeks in a row or anything like that where the cost is enormous for for supporters. So it, they just seem to have hit a really sweet spot at the moment. And the way as well also that how it's evolved, like it hasn't evolved um, the way that we thought it was going to be. You know, we picked three teams to start the year. We thought we we're going to come out of it. That's not the three teams that are coming out of it. Brilliant. And there's been loads of little stories along the way. And you need that because if it goes one direction and it's so predictable, that in itself will lose an interest. And I wouldn't even think we'd have the same interest in this Munster final at the weekend if it had not had all the twists and turns it had. So, look, Munster hurling at the moment across all codes in terms of Gaelic football, ladies Gaelic football, Camogie, whatever, Munster hurling is the, the blueprint of what people want to have now. They want to have that balance of competition, that, um, I suppose, balance of having your underdogs versus this, you know, insurmountable task that's Limerick but then you have teams taking scouts off them so it's just it's brilliant it's absolutely brilliant and we're, we're very lucky to have it as well we're absolutely very lucky to have it but you can see why the attendances are huge like just the games have been incredible they've been brilliant games and as well what's great as well is going to the different venues as well going to the, up to Ennis going down to Parky Cueve like they're great venues you know so it's what's you know what's not to like about it? yeah I think that ruthless streak is important as well I think that will eventually evolve into the football where you won't have a situation where two dozen games have to be played in order to just remove four teams from the championship. And you probably could have guessed the four teams in the football who were going to be eliminated from the group stage anyway. Um, supporters know that that element of danger isn't there. While if you were a Cork or Limerick fan last week, you knew how cutthroat it was and you had to get a ticket to try and be there to watch the last game to be there. And even you talk about no dead rubbers, Tipperary would have thought they were playing a Waterford team who had nothing to play for Tipperary lose out in the final day and as it works out miss out in the place <coughs> in the Munster final so mm. that kind of balance between competition drives that interest I think for people to go as well um, this coming weekend Skell you know Limerick have obviously had their issues with Clare as a matchup over the last couple of years and you've already mentioned the I guess psychological motivation there that Clare will have gained from going to the Gaelic grounds and coming out with a win earlier this season as well they'll point to last year the fact that they weren't beaten inside 70 minutes by Limerick either um, is this a case that Clare the best team right now in the country to take Limerick on? Yes. Yeah, they are. Um, and I think you'd be mad to say not because uh, the proof is in the pudding, like say. If you were to apply just general logic to this, they've beaten Limerick. <laughs> so they've beaten them already. And it wasn't too far ago, uh, too long ago, should I say. And they ran them extremely close last year. I think what happens is sometimes is with Clare is we kind of get, um, I suppose, I won't, I won't use the word, just distracted by the way they performed against Kenny last year in the semi-final. And that kind of did away with their, their good season last year. So obviously they've changed things a bit specifically with the league and the way they rolled into it. And they're in a great spot now at the moment. And I just think from a from a like physically uh, clear match Limerick, like there's not many teams that can match Limerick now at the moment. So probably a, less than a handful. But physically they do pace wise, they they definitely do like a, in terms of their forward units in midfield and they trouble Limerick. Like we always say, you know, the best way to get at Limerick is to run run at them. Because if you start delivering balls to, into heavy areas where they've got very nice sweeping, etc., it's different to clear around them. We're clear of a good mix whereby they can use, you know, Fitzgerald, Taylor, Tony Kelly, O'Donnell, etc., 
and they just have they seem to have a good matchup against them. Like I would have said previously that when you have playing Limerick, it's a question of matchups go against you because they have so many influential players. Like if you mark Galan and Flanagan, you've got Lynch popping up. If you mark him, you've got Hegarty popping up, etc. So when you mix that with a probably, I suppose a, a, a I won't a bad run of form to, to truthfully honest, some of their biggest players. You know, it's 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 a right time for Claire to go at them again. Um, and it's very it's it's extremely hard game to call it. Like I I genuinely I I don't think a game in recent memory now I could be I could be correct here, lads, but is there any game in recent memory whereby people the debate for choosing a team is so broad? Like people can go to Limerick, yeah. you can get a fifty percent over here, fifty percent over clear, and they'll all have the reasons. And I agree with them all. You know, I can agree with with, with with most reasons. So I when when you're calling this game, like I think it's going to be a point or two, max. You know, I'm not I'm not putting away extra time either. Because who knows what's what's going to happen with these two teams? Because it's always been the, the narrowest of margins. So, yeah, I'm going to sit in the fence in this one. Fear I get a draw. Yeah. I. Jeez, you're really sitting in the fence if you're not really, even saying yeah. a draw. Jeez, I, I don't know. My <laughs> head is wrecked. He's the cagey. Is, <laughs> he's given uh, a margin to either side here. Yeah, I can't even go for in a draw. My thoughts, that's, 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 <laughs> in my thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you're, 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 you're getting flashes now of lads with like uh, profilers of Colin Lynch and Ollie Baker and stuff abusing yeah. you now during the week. That's your problem now. Oh God, no, I, don't, I love don't let them win, Scale. No, I love that. Oh, please bring bring that on. I love that. Um, I just don't. I just, I just think like I, I was, I was going through an awful lot of games this year, like on who the teams I've called to win, and like I every time I call something with clear, like I, I get it wrong. Do you know what I mean? Like I say, you know, I call we call Tipperary to be clear. Okay, we got that one right. We call Limerick to be clear. We got that one wrong. Uh, I actually, I think Murph, did you call Cork to be clear? I no, we both. I, excuse me, we're saying correctly. We both called clear to be Cork. We did. Oh, yeah. Hold yeah, on here yeah. a second now. Not to stop you. This brings you back to mm. last week's episode because someone caught you out in the comments on YouTube and Scale was straight in. I didn't know that Scale actually had his own account where he was uh, able to either. sneak in. Uh, someone either. someone pointed out that he had not picked Dublin to qualify in the Leinster Championship. He picked Wexford and then Scale goes, yeah, but the two boys missed it and didn't pick it and call me out in it. I, when, I, when they said it live, right, none of you commented and I said, I got away with that one. <laughs> so, <laughs> rocking. so keep moving, keep moving. Yeah. The, the, the podcast listeners and the hurling pod community will always call you up on these things there's someone else who will always scrub back through the video and have a quick check and go Public wait a minute yeah. he didn't say that um but sorry i was breaking your flow there skell you were saying that we've got claire wrong quite a few times which i did well, and we got them wrong where we placed him in the championship as well yeah like i just i find it very hard to call it because again i i put an awful lot of emphasis on when i'm when i'm assessing the team you know momentum is huge for me it's massive because you know like when the momentum stops it's awful hard to get it going again like you know yourself like more when you're when you've got mm. a team that's rolling well, it's it's I won't say it's easy, but it's easy or to keep it rocking and, and improve. When you go through, let's say, a, a run of maybe a bad result or a bad run of form, it's so hard to get it back into the kind of get get a performance. You know you can you can get because it's so the, the gap seems so far away. But I just look at Clare now and I just think they have momentum. The, the mm. wheel is moving and you know they're, they're they're coming in at a very, very right time. And I'm not I'm, not, I'm by no means doubting Limerick at all because they're they're an excellent team. But just I'm just putting that emphasis on the momentum they've gained, and that I think they're going to get more traction over it. I'm that's why I'm kind of leaning towards a draw, or I'm going to say a clear victory. Let's. The two lads on the pitch have gotten his head, Murph. That's what's happened there. Hey, no, they have not. <laughs> Jesus, it's got in my head. Will you get out of there? A lot of my head. Oh, oh. <laughs> I can I can say that. But them two lads are not in my head. Don't worry. <laughs> the the care mafia have definitely got to him. Um, Murph, when it comes to this game, obviously notwithstanding, it's early in the week, so we're not sure exactly what's going to happen injury-wise where we're going to clear his shoulder. He's probably going to miss the game, it seems. We don't know where Keane Lynch is at either because he was limping and I think it's probably be later in the week before we find out you know, how bad it is for him. It seems maybe his hamstring is uh, plaguing him a little bit at the moment, so we're not sure if he's going to be able to start. So taking those two factors even into account, are you thinking this is going to be as close as James just argued it was going to be? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, like there's a few things that not concerns for both sides, but clearly a big one for Clare. Okay, if 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 Cleary was playing, it's such fine margins that if he was playing, I was saying, well, that shores up a little bit more in the defense in terms of he's he's a great linchpin for them in defense. You know, comes out very solid there, and it's very hard to find a fullback, a solid fullback. You know, that's consistent there. Uh, and Cleary has great physicality as well, which is you know you always need spades of that when you're playing Limerick. So. It's that's that's going to be one area now for Claire. And as we've seen earlier um, in the in the round robin, particularly against Tipperary to start, that they were they were leaking a lot of goals, and putting a lot of pressure on themselves to get do hard work to get over the line to win games. 
So that's the area that Clare are going to be looking at. And Clare are a very emotional team. Like if you were to ask me who's an emotional team that they play off emotion, that's Clare. Um, and so they're going to come at this game, you know, fire and brimstone. And if they smell a small bit of doubt with Limerick, that I feel will only feed into Clare then because they're going, we have these ads again. And you look at Limerick then, and like obviously Limerick are an exceptional team, but they do have hints of what I would say ourselves in 2013, whereby we were still an excellent team, absolutely. But because we had one or two results that went against us, whereby Dublin bet us, we picked up one or two injuries. It was just going week on week trying to get back to that stage where you were this 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 runaway train. Trying to get it back to that level is very hard when you're hurling every two weeks or you know every even three weeks. It's 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 not that far anymore. Like you know these lads are playing so regular that if you had like six weeks off, you might get get back into that flow again. But Limerick don't have that at the moment. So you know, like you said with Lynch. So there's a few things there that there's question marks over. Like is Lynch carrying a knock? Will he play? Won't he play? Will he be as effective as he was last year, which we haven't seen him being as effective this year? And a few players then with Limerick again haven't hit the heights that they hit last year. So that would lead into saying that you know the areas are there for Clare to build serious momentum in this game. Um, and similar enough to let's say when Cork beat us in 2013 in that quarter final. You know we were still the favourites going into that game as Limerick will be going into this game, I'd imagine. I, I don't know. I'd imagine like the Buckleys will have them as favourites. Yeah, I think so. Um, but nevertheless, once, let's say, we had Henry sent off in 2013, once Cork smelt it, then they went, there was a big incident in a game that turned for them. So if Clare get something going early on where they get up two or three points or they get a goal, hit the back of the net, and suddenly Limerick are rattled, and let's say Limerick pick up an injury, a few small things like this feeds into Clare going. And I just think... I do think Clare are actually in a great position here to go and win this game. I really do. Um, better than last year for the Munster final even because they have that win under the belt against Limerick so recently in the Gaelic rounds. There's just, and, and, and like James was saying, because this all comes down to such small margins, those indicators there, I'm looking going, Jesus, we have like even a better kind of perfect storm than we had last year. It's just better again, you know? So it, it, it is a very tough one to call. Um, like, yeah. <laughs> You don't want to call a draw. You just don't want to call it because it's, it's nearly boring. But like, you look like a legend if you do call a draw when it does happen. But like at the moment, I'm sitting here going, like, full respect to Limerick, but I'm kind of thinking a li- the momentum could be with Clare here at the moment. But now I say that as well. I say that as well when I think before we recorded the pod, when, when Cork and Clare were going to play, I was going Cork, 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 you know. And once I gave a few days, then I went, Actually, I think because we didn't do the predictions that week, that was it. Yeah. And on the Friday, you were you I asked. Forgot, us, I'd I was like, send you a text and go, "Who's going to win?" Yeah, and if you asked me on the Monday that week, I would have told you Cork. I probably would have told you Cork. And then as the week went on, I went myself and Skelly both went Clare. Um, and I think that's what we're having here. Like as in sitting here now Monday morning <laughs> on the bank holiday, I'm saying, "Geez, I can feel that this could go Clare's way." But I'd mm. say now, if we were talking on Friday, I'd be going, "I could be saying Limerick." Do you know what I mean? But I'll, I'll put my I'll put my, my my money where my mouth is now, and Monday I'll say Claire. <clears throat> Don't worry, the pod title is already there. Claire will beat Limerick on Sunday. That's going to be the title. The <laughs> hurling pod. Claire will Who beat Limerick calling? definitively. Who, Who am I calling? calling? I actually think Limerick are going to win this time. I like. I take all your points about Claire, but I just have this feeling that Limerick have got the big performance in them. Uh, this time mm. around, I think slowly but surely we were talking about it last week. Yeah, that, yeah. You know, there are these issues that they've ch- had to kind of iron out a little bit with the performances so far. But I was never too down on Limerick after the defeat they took against Clare mm. either in the game. Like I think you could almost spin that game both ways. In that Clare found a way to beat Limerick. Limerick were maybe a little bit off it, but were still within a shot of the game going into the last few seconds of the match. And they'll probably feel if we get another goal with these guys again, we'll turn them over next time. But mm. I'm like, yeah, I don't expect this to be more than two or three points either way. And I just <clears> think Limerick will probably get over <laughs> it by a couple of points. I don't know what the composition is going to be like, by the way. I know you were saying, Scale, it might be kind of 50-50 with the way the tickets went in general sale. I don't know how many Limerick people got their hands on tickets before Ticketmaster kind of went to pot. And whether it's going to be a really vociferous home crowd there. Um, but I think it's a big ask for Claire to go and play there. I think if it was me... And I was Clare County board. No way would I have agreed to go to the Gaelic Ground split. It's on principle. I would have said it has to be in the neutral venue. And look, I know nobody, I think, in either circumstance would have really wanted to have to slog all the way down to Porky Cueve. But I still think even going to Porky Cueve would have been preferential to having to take on the All-Ireland champions in their home ground. So I think that's a little bit of a tipping point towards Limerick as well. I mm. actually think if this game had been in Thurlis, 
I'd probably be opting for Clare to win. That they're the type of margins that we have going to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, do you both agree? I'll give you the first shout to Murph with Anthony Nash on Friday was saying that he thinks the All Ireland champions will come out of this final. It will either be Limerick or Clare. They're the two favourites. He put them one and two in his power rankings effectively. Oh, um, that's a tough one now as well uh, because oh. Because for me, one big thing that I'll be looking at is, yeah, absolutely, where the Munster teams are at the moment in terms of performance. Um, not to say they're peaking around them. They're not. They're all hoping to peak around all in semi-final, all in final stage. But it's hard for them not to be going eyes out at this stage because it's do or die, you know. Hmm. Um, and we saw, I think we saw a hint of it last year, what the attrition rate of that does to teams. Limerick could sustain it last year, but just about, you know, as in... I just think Clare last year didn't have the panel to go and sustain that. Uh, and But no one could have foresaw what happened in the semi-final against Kilkenny. No one would have thought that that would have happened. But like losing John Conlon was obviously a big part of it. But I just think the injuries and the the, the weeks on the road just, just caught up to them that much. And the freshness of Kilkenny and Galway coming through on the other side then stood to them. You know, they had that those few less injuries. Uh, and also Kilkenny's mind was focused for, for the task at hand. So I think there's a few more things there to be considered. Um, it's, it's certainly a big shout. Like, I mean, obviously enough, like probably the odds are that the All-Ireland champions would come from Munster because, I mean, you're dealing with Limerick. I mean, they're the favourites, mm. of course. But if Clare turn, Clare turn Limerick over, I mean, that's a, that's a phenomenal team. And like Kilkenny or Galway or whoever going to be facing going forward, you know? So um, I wouldn't I wouldn't name a colours to the mass with that just yet. Like I appreciate where Anthony Nash is coming from, but like there's so much can happen. Now, like, you know, over the weekend, either one of those teams picks up injuries. Like, those are things you have to factor in. Injuries picked up in these games to key players. Like, you know, if you touch wood, you look at if, if Clare picked up an injury to, like, Dermot Ryan, even, for example, or Tony Kelly, or if Clare picked up that. And you look at Limerick also at the moment, whereby they have some players that are not hitting the form they were hitting before. If you saw the likes of Tom Morrissey or whoever picking up a big injury there, Dermot Burns, it's a huge loss at this stage because it all comes back to what you're saying, Will, is those fine margins. Like it's so fine at the moment yeah. that no team can afford big injuries. Whereas you look at Kilkenny and Galway will come through a match at the weekend and they're at, they're fresher at the moment than the Munster teams because they haven't had those week on week, you know, real cut and trust trust matches. So uh I I wouldn't be I'd be hesitant to say yes that um the All Ireland champions will come from Munster just yet because I, I also even look at Galway. Like, I mean, I know we'll get on to Kilkenny and Galway soon enough, but, you know, Galway could blossom a little bit later than than anyone I expect. You look at them last year against Limerick in the semi final, and, you know, Galway went home from that game, ruined a few chances they had because mm-hmm. they were in with a shout coming down the home straight. Galway didn't perform well in the Leinster final last year. So there's lots of things there where, like, they're coming in rightly under the radar. Um, and it probably suits them as well that everybody is looking at Munster. It suits Kilkenny and Galway that everybody is talking about Munster, Munster, Munster. It's perfectly fine with, with, with both of those teams. So, I, I like I said, I appreciate where Anthony Nash is coming from, but I wouldn't be able to say that just yet. That Oh, yeah, absolutely, that Kilkenny and Galway aren't firing enough to go and win in All-Ireland. Yeah, I just have the paths written here, Skell, before I ask you how it goes from here, because um, I had it in my head, but now I wrote it down this morning just to have it. So, the primary quarterfinals are on... This Saturday, June the 17th. So Carlo, the John McDonough champions, will be at home against Dublin and Tipperary go to Offaly. So then the way the quarterfinals break down from there, the losers of Galway and Kilkenny seven days later will play Offaly or Tipperary and the losers of Clare and Limerick will play Carlo or Dublin. And then there's the bit of a break until the semifinals on July the 8th where you've got Clare or Limerick against quarterfinal winners. And then obviously the provincial finalists will go directly through to those semis. So... And there's a long way to go yet, but that's the path to get yourself into the last four at this stage is how the teams will have to come through it. So do you think as well, Skell, that it's going to be a Clare or Limerick winner this year or do you think it'll come outside of that? I think on current, current the, 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 the operative word here is current, and current form is you'd have to say yes, one of the two. Mm. Um, but I, I, again, I, I side with more from this because, like <clears throat> again, logic and evidence last year, we saw what happened. And that's, that's, that's to say it'll repeat itself. However, like Munster is a very, very tough championship to come through and... I'm not just counting Tipperary either. Like, just, just that was the only thing I, I only noticed. I didn't even say Tipperary. Yeah, Do you know. From Munster, from Munster perspective, I know people will focus on the finals, you know, on, on, the, on the four teams in the finals. But I'm looking at Munster or Tipperary as well. Excuse me, and saying, "She's the dim lads." Can you imagine what training was like over the last ten days? 
or sorry, eight days in, in January <laughs> after the performance against Watford. I mean, can, can you imagine, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. what, 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 the, what the choice words they would have had for each other? You know, so I'd say they're going to come out rocking again at, uh, next weekend. We can. They've been a bit unlucky with the injuries, though, Skell. Again, Garota Connor looks like he's now going to miss the rest of the year, but maybe that pays itself back if Jason Ford is back at the end of the. Mm-hmm. He should be back, I think, based on it was four weeks, I think, initially, and we're on to week three of those four. So in theory, maybe Ford could even be on the bench for the Offaly game in a week's yeah, we, time, and then like, he works his way back in. They lose Gareth Connor, but there's a lad there on the bench called Seamus Cannon. Yeah. <laughs> Fire him in, you know what I mean? Yeah, I think he's capable of a pint or two. <laughs> so like, and he can take a, he can take a few frees. Um, so I, I can't call it at the moment. I just think it's too early. Like it's, The only time to call the championship is when it's, it, before the championship even starts. Or the final. I just I can't call it the middle of that because so much can happen. And I and Murph, like we've we've been part of teams whereby you lose a player or you have a bad performance or something goes something goes arseways against you, you know what I mean? <laughs> Whether it be on the pitch or off the pitch. And it, it just it could just derail your whole year. So it's very, very hard for us to say with certainty, any degree of certainty at all, that it'll be limited clear. I think there's a huge chance and if if you were putting money on it at the minute, it, it, they'd be the lowest odds, those two teams. But right now I would reserve my th- my thoughts and say no, nope, it won't. Not, not yet. Not yet. No, I, can't, I can't comment. No, I'm trying. To, I'm trying. I'm trying to put myself here in my head. <laughs> oh, I, I've, got, I've got two people here. I've got the devil and I've got the angel in my head. And say, yeah. You won't. <laughs> like, no, no, it's not. I just, I, yeah. Galway's chances. I, I do think genuinely Gal Kinney have a lesser chance than Limerick here at the moment. At the moment, right? But that's not to say that give it a few weeks, as we said, and get the wheel rolling again for them, those two teams who who come into the heat of the championship. Um, things will change. So look, I'll I'll leave it there for the moment. Right. I'm not, I'm not really, well, really deciding a lot today, am I? I'm, I'm kind of very... Oh, for a man who oh. fires from the hip yeah. in general in life. <laughs> yeah, in life, yeah. <laughs> He's become That's remarkably, true. remarkably diplomatic, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the sag continues with Kilkenny and Galway then on Sunday afternoon, four o'clock at Crow Park. So you've played in a few of these finals, but 2010, 12, 15, 16, 18, 20, 21, 22 and 23. So it's been a very regular meeting. Those eight games we've had so far... Six of them have been won by Kilkenny, Murph. Is it going to be seven out of nine at the end of the weekend? I believe so, yeah. I know Skett was going to say you have to say that. But um, no, like there, there wasn't a lot learned from the game in Nolan Park, um, be, being truthful. Like, I mean, I know it was a draw and all that, but um, not both sides didn't go out intentionally not to show their hand. But I just think inadvertently they didn't show their hand either way. And if you look at last year, then in the in the Leinster final, like I said, like Galway weren't happy and wouldn't be happy with how they performed. They went out with one game plan, and when the game plan didn't work, they didn't really change it up. Like the half back sat off to Kenny that day. I don't think they'll do that. I think they'll they'll obviously push right up on them now and be confident with their backs to go toe to toe with them. I think we've seen the likes of Dahi Burke stepping out in centre back has been. It, it, it's it's actually funny enough for a lad who's a full back. It actually provides a bit more for Galway going forward. Funnily enough, because he's such a steady lad to win the ball, he uses it so well. And you see him coming up, sure, scoring a goal last weekend, and he's popped up with points as well. Like I mean, um, he's provided that bit of kind of impetus for them at centre back and drives them forward. And like we said last week, grabs the game by the scruff of the neck. So they oh, have a bit of an injection there that they didn't have last year. You know, that's, that's from the football Murphy. So he plays midfield for Cardiff. Yeah, yeah, uh, true. Huge football team. He's always going up and down. Up yeah, I say that that's what you're what you're saying. It's uh, it's added a dimension to Galway's game that he can drive up the field and get back because he's a machine too. Oh, he is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And in fairness, even McInerney, like the the physicality he 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 provides at full back. I mean, look at, I mean, Dahi Burke always did that as well. But McInerney back there as well. Like, I mean, he's a unit of a man, yeah. um, and well capable of driving out also himself. But I mean, Kilkenny, look, I'd be really happy with Kilkenny's panel is at at the moment, and um, they seem to be they've blooded so many players and lots of players have put their hand up. I find it very hard to pick Kilkenny fifteen now for this weekend, um, because I do believe that because Kilkenny have, have tried so many players, Derek Ling will be will kind of have seen. Look, we've tried a few things like Park Welch has been cornerback, he's been wing back. We have Paddy Deegan at wing forward now. We played the All Ireland final at wing back last year. We have Mikey Carey coming back into the equation, who was who was excellent last year for Kilkenny. There's a variety of things there. With Billy Drennan hurling great again this year. Okay, wasn't flying at the last day or anything, but you know a lot of players have put their hand up. That I think Kenny. Now, granted, there's a few injuries. I think Derek will have a fair idea of where he wants to get his matchups. Maybe he wants to draw a few lads out of position, the likes of Park Mannion and a few of these. So that's where the battle is going to be won and lost. But I think Kenny have the tools to go and do that. Now the few injuries there from the last day. That's where I'd have the concern. You know, Mossy, Mikey Butler, and Adrian Mullen. What is the situation? If those boys are injured, 
Like that's a serious platform for Galway. Those are those are three really good players for Kilkenny to be missing. So um Kilkenny have had Galway's number over the last few years, you know, with the current crop of players. Kilkenny, I feel like there was a there was a period there, like with Skettle and the boys, where you know they bet us in Leinster finals and that, and you know, the wheel turned a small bit, but it's, I think it's kind of gone back the other direction now. And um I, I just I feel like Kilkenny have enough for Galway at the moment. Galway just haven't shown a huge amount yet to think that okay, this is seriously dangerous threat now for Kilkenny. And uh, the one thing that Kilkenny will look to do though is that goal threat. They've been leaking a few goals at the back line, and it's just been making hard work for them going forward. Very similar for Clare. You know, when you're leaking those kind of easy enough goals, um, you can make your peace with a with a savage goal going in that a team opened you up and you know fair play, but. Kenny have been coughing up a few too handy goals. So I think that's where some there, there's an area that Kenny going to look for. But I just see mm-hmm. Kenny having enough firepower and having the men markers to go and 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 tie tie Galway up in the forward line. I think they learned a few things also from the game in Old Park. So no, I'd be happy with Kenny going into this game at the weekend that they're to come out three or four points. Now, Skell, the reports last Monday after the game in Wexford were that Adrian Mullen had picked up a hand injury. He was to go off and uh, treatment on it, but he could potentially be out for a month, which would mean he'd miss the Leinster final this weekend. You're licking your lips thinking he's not going to be on the pitch, aren't you? Um, yeah, from a goal perspective, obviously, we, we, I'd like every Kikini player to be available. And if, if, you're, if you're good enough to take them down, you know, there's much more merit in a victory than that. But if he's injured, he's injured. Like, I, I think from our perspective also, is uh, in the Leinster final last year. Like he, I think he did. He score five points from play last year in the Leinster final. Mm. He did, yeah. yeah. So like he caused an awful lot of issues. Like I think Mannion picked, as well down Mannion side, doesn't he? You know, he's picked on the on the the wing forward side, but he came out to midfield a lot a lot from distance. Like so, that's kind of a theme of concern for me. Is that if you look at the Kikini game, um, specifically in the second half, actually, Murph, let's say when when Kikini opened up a bit of a gap, like our half back line, we're just we're, we're, we're trying to play what's the word I use zona, we're trying to play zone, mm. you know, and sitting off the Kikini forwards and allowing them to shoot and. I think uh, of all teams, like you don't, you don't let you don't let Kenny shoot. You don't let like some Mullen get the ball out there or TJ or whoever whoever finds himself in that area because they have the players to, to to hurt you. And then when Galway were going poor against Dublin last week, it was the same kind of situation where our halfbacks were sitting off and Dublin boys were picking up um, the ball in midfield because we were just completely outnumbered. And then when the when the wheel turned or the things changed, is when we pushed up and started to actually get tight and then go man for man, um, which is where within their locker, I think they probably. At times, teams will try to focus and try to keep it tight at the back, which I accept, okay? Which is obviously, that that's your, you know, your, your I suppose, hope is to keep everything tight at the back. But if you're getting damaged out the field, then you, know, then you have to just, all bets are off, shove up and go man to man, or else pull people back. It's not even always, you know, I think DNA to pull the hippo lads back. I think if, really, historically, we go 15 on 15 and see, can we can we take them down? Um, but like, it's, it's I, I, I had concern from the Kenny game with the way we played for a period. But then I was like, I was delighted. No more than the Dublin game, concern as well. But we pulled it back. Like we pulled it back. So that means we're we're always there at, at, at the end, right? And a big thing for me as well, the more than Mullen, potentially Mr. Kinney, is Cahill Mannion. Like he, he didn't play against Dublin last week. You know, I'm hoping that he's recovered from his injury. I think it's a hamstring or something like that. A, a soft tissue kind of job. Um, so like he's, I, I've said it here numerous times, he's pivotal to go always course. Um, and if he's missing, that's a, that's a big loss. Like a big, big loss for to be missing a runner out around there um but again this is where my my head and my heart get completely you know dis- disjointed because <laughs> my heart is saying go away 100 percent go away right but my head is just looking again the more than what i say about every other team logic and we haven't been playing well let's it's as simple as that on one hand on the other hand in we've been clawing games back so i'm kind of torn um i wouldn't be expecting go to go and just blitz kikini like say you know five or six point five. that would not happen i think if we get over them It'll be by a point or two, um, and I'm, I'm wishful, <laughs> wishful this moment. Yeah, I was way more confident last year, Murph, and I will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, way more were, confident yeah. last year. I was like, yeah, we're going to win this, you know, because obviously we played really well in Pierce Stadium mm-hmm. against Kilkenny, and we shut down some big players. And I was saying, yeah, they can do it again. They, they provided the evidence. Whereas I'm looking at evidence now, and I'm saying we're not. We're we're kind of stuttering a bit, like you know. Yeah. We kind of have the choke on. We're not. We're not fully. Oh, we haven't opened up the engine just yet. So yeah. I'm. Ho- I'm hoping that we, you know, like we're saying about Munster versus Leinster, that this is kind of just it's a progress thing, and that next thing comes Sunday they'll open up, right? Which I it was, it was well within their locker, should I say. So mm. yeah, 
fingers crossed. Well, Murph, one of the reasons that Galway didn't beat Kilkenny last year is because of their shooting. And we spoke about that a lot. It was way down into the kind of low 40s for a shooting return and they were taking shots from yeah. positions where they wouldn't like to take them. And maybe we didn't give enough credit to Kilkenny last year that Kilkenny mm. were doing a good job of not letting them around the scoring zone. So they're having to shoot from bad positions. Kilkenny, I'm sure, would take something like that again on Sunday afternoon. Yeah, they would, absolutely. And and like you hit the nail on the head with that. Um, Kilkenny just really got their matchups really well last year. Like uh, my one abiding memory from the game was just that. Remember the the Galway half back line just sitting back that small bit, hoping that Kilkenny wouldn't shoot from distance and that they'd basically draw them onto him and that Galway would win the physical battle as the players were coming through. But as we saw, what happened was that just wasn't the case. Like Adrian Mullen being the example stood out around midfield. And I remember one particular case where Galway worked really hard to get a point. Owen Murphy pucks the ball out to Adrian Mullen who's standing on his own at midfield because Galway were sticking to the process of, you know, we're not going to follow them. Yeah, out the Cusick's hand. Yeah. Pucked it straight down to him. Adrian caught the ball and stuck it over the bar. And it just went, for all the hard work that Galway did, they were coughing up two easy scores. Um, but, like, I wouldn't underestimate how crucial Adrian Mullen is there. Like, I mean, by all accounts, he, he did pick up a, a bad hand injury against Wexford. And the work he gets through in a game... Um, like that work will have to be shouldered somewhere else if he's not going to be there. You know, you have to share that work because Grandy pops up with five points in the Leinster final. But you look at him all around the field, be it in the Clare match and the Galway match last year, whatever, he could pop up a corner back and pick up a ball and cruise out and he just pops it off and he motors on and then is involved later on up the pitch. Like those players are absolutely <clears throat> crucial to Kenny's cause. Um, and what I thought Kenny did good last year as well in the Leinster final, and I think Galway will be aware to this year. And I think, you know, if Kenny want to go and win this game, maybe touch back onto that, was they they weren't afraid for any of their defenders to push right up in terms of once we have the ball, go go and support the players in possession. And if you find yourself up, um, in, in you're in the full back line, but you find yourself up in the opposition's 45, that's fine. You know, it was kind of like this, you know, it was aggressive stuff when they needed to be aggressive. And it just, they just struck the balance really well. So I think Kenny looked to do that. Um but again, like you said, Will, I mean, Galway's wide. Do you even go back to the Dublin match last week as well? Kilkenny will look to put pressure on Galway that if there is an element of doubt there and Galway are inclined that way to shoot from silly angles because maybe that's a confidence thing. It always comes back to it. Maybe it's a little bit of confidence and not sticking to the process. Well, maybe Kilkenny will go, lads, we've seen it. They've, they've given us evidence recently, like against Dublin, that they will shoot from silly angles. We'll put pressure on them. And as a defender, that's brilliant to have because you know if you... If you burst your bollocks and you put pressure on them, that it'll reap rewards because they may be liable to shoot. So it, it gives you, it's nearly fuel for you as a defender that if 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 you're facing a forward line that does that, well, brilliant. That's what we want to do. And, you know, players would say that in dress rooms before games. So Galway looked to clamp down on that big time because they're a very efficient team when they go and they, they stick to the process. But at the same time, like I said, even over the years, I've seen Galway rack up, no more than any other team really, but rack up wides Um when they really need to just keep the scoreboard ticking over. So, look, Kenny will look to maybe hard, touch into what Dublin tapped into over the weekend, hit them hard, put them under pressure, like Skettle was saying there, maybe get them into a position where they're just struggling to get the flow into the game. Um, and while that happens, don't allow what happened in Nolan Park, where you go ahead, but you allow them back into the game. So it's there's a few things here, but both sides, to be honest, at this stage now, will be looking to up their performances over the last while. Like Kenny or Galway aren't happy at where they're at at the moment. So I think it's important for both teams, you know, to get out there and put in a savage performance. Whatever the result, you up the levels now because both teams are getting to really important stages of the year that you can't keep saying every week that, oh, sure, look, they have another match, they have another match. We're getting we're getting really close to you just having a flop of a year if you don't go out and perform this week. Yeah, I think it's fair to say we've got one saying Kilkenny's going to win, one says Go is going to win, which brings us very nicely around to the listener questions. I've got a good one which came in from Joe Malloy of OTB Towers in a moment that I didn't see because he sent it last week during the live, but he sent it onto my Twitter and I wasn't watching. I was watching the comments coming in from Facebook and from YouTube. So I'll throw that one because it's Kilkenny against Go in a moment. But just before we take that... I can't remember what it was. I know what's coming. I can see the smirk in your face. Go on. Oh, he's, he's got the notes done. Um, but a quick one for you, Scott. Oh, yeah. yeah wrote to that one, <laughs> which came in from, uh, I need to just get his name to give him the proper credit here, which was Pad John. Question for James. Should Connor Cooney be dropped for the Leinster final? Dropped is a harsh word. Jeez. Um, no, not Connor Cooney, I, I think at the moment, uh, as I'll just go back. 
club hurling in Galway, right? Conor Cooney is not alone is he the best club hurler. He is streets ahead of everyone in club hurling. Like, he is awesome, right? So, yeah. like, we, we, in Galway, we look at him and go, he can do this, no problem, right? And, like, I have faith in the kid, like, he, or the kid's like, the man, he, he can do this, like. So, if you've got a player who has that in their locker and can shoot from angles and score big frees and take lads on, like, you, you start him. I think you have to start Conor Cooney. Yeah, he's going through a bit of a, a bit of a dry spell, if you want to call it that. Like, a, similar to what maybe Hector G. or Lynch is going through. But I just think he's an important physical person to have in that half forward line, especially, especially against a team like Limerick who are physical themselves. Or, excuse me, who are physical themselves in the half-back line. So, we're going to have to... We have, to, we have to use him because if you look at our bench then we like we have guys <clears throat> who come in like Declan McLaughlin and Liam Collins are predominantly you could say corner forward so that they're 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 really full forward line um and then the big man we have to say in the half forward really would be Jason who kind of is more of a finisher as opposed to a, an aggressor if you want to call it Jason Flynn so I think from it's just a lot of average that like we have to start Connor and just you know give him the benefit of the doubt and see can he produce it give him an opportunity because he's done it before for us so if you've done it before you know it's in the locker there somewhere so yeah keep him Okay, so at Malloy Joe on Twitter last week, Will, long time, first time, which is our slight tangent uh, intro for anyone sending us emails during the week, by the way. He says, and I'll throw it to you first, Murph, because I know the scale will have strong opinions in this anyway. <laughs> would scale have Joe Canning over TJ? So more importantly, would Paul Murphy have TJ Reid over Joe Canning? How's about we change the question and slightly to let you first go here? Yeah, I would. Um, and there's absolutely no disrespect to, to Joe, but I've marked both of them. And um, like two incredible hurlers, like, you know, and, and the one thing I would have always been saying about both of them was just that my motto with these things is that they're such incredible hurlers that you don't picture what you do if they're running down the sideline against you or how do you, you try not to let them get the ball in their hand. That's day one. And I just always felt that TJ was just that bit more adept at. You know, you could go up with TJ pulling and dragging out of him, going for a catch, and he just catches it. Like, he just catches the ball. And when he lands, I think it's it, one of the great things Henry had for him was Henry's movement when you weren't looking. He knew when you just took your eyes off him to look up the pitch where the ball was, and Henry would break, and he'd go, and he'd drift. Lark Corbett had something similar about him. TJ has a great ability to do that, mm. whereby he just drifts, creates space, and he's robot-like. He's absolutely robot-like. I mean, likewise, Joe incredible incredible hurler as well um but i always felt that dj just had if you were marking him had just one or two more tools to hurt you you know his his touch in a tight area and the one thing that i think he, he is like obviously joe has has areas that he's probably maybe stronger than tj in but the areas that i thought yeah. tj is incredible at is his sidestep like tj had a thing where he's standing in front of you and because you know he's so dangerous and like the two boys play the game very differently as well you know they're not the same type of player but TJ plays it differently. Like TJ nearly faced you. He'd have a look around. And because he's such a dangerous forward, defenders give him a yard because you don't want to commit because he'll go around you. But TJ will just throw a shimmy and he could either pop it over the bar or throw a sidestep where you're gone and he's gone then. Whereas if you always look at Joe, quite often Joe was on the move taking the ball. He'd take the ball, he's on the move. And because he's deceptively fast, it was actually very hard to stay into Joe. And Joe had a great way also then of leaning into you. As you were running, he'd lean in, either draw a free or absolutely shove you aside and then step away and score. So they play the game very differently. But mm. I would just say from a point of view of that, you, you could have played TJ corner forward <laughs> or midfield nearly, whereas Joe was very much a half forward. That's what I always felt, like a half forward, full forward. If you got stuck in the corner, I I prefer that as a defender. Um, but like to be honest now, this is like picking Messi Ronaldo stuff. Like obviously, you know, like you're now you're you're talking about two of the best hurlers of all time. But if I was picking a team and I could only pick one of them, I'd be picking TJ. I see. Once Joe Canning was confirmed for our upcoming roadshow, I was like, wait a minute now, he's going to have a goal. Canning here. And we can use this for material when Canning walks out on the stage. And instead, what do you want me to say about Canning? <laughs> yeah, ah, yeah, yeah. You've, you've kind of been reasonably positive about him there where he couldn't be too offended that you were just edging towards TJ. So, Scal mm. obviously has got the notebook out here because I can see writing going on in the background. Sure. So, what's, what, what's in the notes here, Scal? Well, before Scal starts, I'm, I'm, go I'm going with the Clare supporters point of view of saying, he just is, all right? But you're going to hit me with the stats here now. <laughs> you're going to be a rain yeah. man here now hitting me with stats. Would you know when the two boys are 16 years of age? Go on. Go on okay. Guys. The first stat I'll give you, okay, boys, is that Kenning has averaged 9.3 points per game, right? So he's obviously third of the list in the highest score, right? He's done it in 62 games. And who's ahead of him? Uh, give me a chance, my friend, right? Sorry. Give me a chance, right? Uh, TJ has averaged 7.7 .7 points per game. Uh, in 79 games, right? So Joe has a better average, right? So just uh, just put that one aside for the moment now, okay? Yeah. So I've listed out a heap of items, and you're right, Murphy. It was like Messi versus Ronaldo. There's 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 pros and cons 
to every argument. And this one is very different because the two were top class, right? But I've listed out all different attributes or different elements of the game. And I've just ticked who who is, you know, whatever. So, pace, right? Okay. Joe's quicker than TJ, okay? <laughs> so I'm using that. Yeah, yeah, probably, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, yeah. no, no yeah. Yeah. I was just thinking, I, I was just thinking, Skehel, all right? I'm getting flashbacks here of trying to catch up with both of them, all right? Okay. <laughs> Fielding, right? Teaches some fielder. Probably the best fielder I've ever seen. Yeah. yeah. Across any game, whether it be a back or forward, he is just ridiculous, like how he gets the ball. I still haven't studied him, right, to how he catches. I still can't understand how he gets his hand to the ball, mm. you know, which is ridiculous, okay? Um, then I have a heap of draws here, right? So I have... Like I call link play, finishing, and big game. There's three draws there. They're, they're, they're all the two boys are classic. Like they're deadly finishers. D- they play really well in big games. Like if you look at Kenning's on Ireland record, he's always in double digits. He's deadly at that, like, right? And then the in the uh the uh the link play, they're deadly bringing people into the game themselves as well. Like you were saying, Murph, you can TJ is, is great at just these 20 yarders, you know, and it seems to open up the whole place, you know what I mean? When he yeah. does these 20 yarders, Joe was deadly at packing at Finding these like arrow passes, I call them. Like, he he put the ball into your mouth at pace, you know. So yeah. that's in three out of the way, right? Now, canning power, canning skill, canning striking, canning dead balls, canning scoring. <laughs> Sorry, canning power. You got a lot of them in quick succession there. Yeah, you just rattled them. <laughs> I did, yeah. <laughs> oh, my Wi Fi's gone. <laughs> so, power, what do you mean power? Striking the ball, is it? Or? So, I, I have power in, in no, no, I'm talking about physical like, power. Power. Break and tackle. He's like, okay. TJ's a big unit, like, he's a big fella. Like, no, no, but, no but TJ, uh, no, sorry, I get you, Canning is, no, Canning does have that physical power run. He's a tank, yeah. Canning, Canning's yeah. a tank. Like, I, I don't think people think, obviously, he's he's hugely skill based, right? But he's a unit, like, mm. you know, he's, and he still is a unit. Um, skill, I just, I, I, there, there isn't a person in this world that will convince me there's anyone more skilled than Joe. It's as simple as that. Uh, he's just what he can do with the ball and touch work. I, I know, and there's arguments yeah. to all, but yeah. it's just, it can't convince me. Like, yeah. he's striking in as well. Next one, like, he's striking, TJ striking is deadly, but Canning striking is just gorgeous. <laughs> like, it was just like, he was, it was, <laughs> that's a perfect word to use, actually. It was just this, gorgeous. This, you know? this is, this has gone away from stats now. Like, for a fellow who's clicking a pen there, going stats, is like, Jesus, <laughs> striking is gorgeous. Did you write like, that down? Did you write that down? The striking is gorgeous. I need to write that down because I'm going to forget yeah. that. I like how the difference between this is one is deadly and one is gorgeous. You know, both are. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and in the last one, way. I have scoring. Uh, so the count here, so I have, there's uh, four draws. Sorry, three draws, excuse me. Uh, six to Canning, one to TJ. So like so. we could just invent basically categories here. I'd say we're better. Like one category, and I'll, I'll give David Herity credit on this because he pointed it out about TJ's. TJ is better at commentating on himself than Joe is. So there's a category he's better. Did you ever hear about this with TJ? No. So like TJ's, like TJ's he's hilarious. So like we'd be training and uh, like TJ is playful when he's playing the game. Like he's in, it's oh, grand. He's, he's methodical about his practice and he, and he, you know, he practices the whole time and he's machine like, but it's still a game for him. Like he's still playing it for the enjoyment. But Herity pointed this out. It was actually on off the ball a few years ago and uh, I'd, I'd forgotten about it. Or I kind of, Maybe I just hadn't noticed it anymore. I don't know, but you could be training in Nolan Park and the balls be thrown out outside the tunnel and lads be coming out it'd be a summer's evening and it'd be great back, you know, and lads be having a bit of crack and TJ come out with the socks up around the knees and listen, come out and as you come out, and the crowd roars and TJ Reid is on the pitch and he'd raise it up and he's on and he sticks it over the bar <laughs> and he'd be just talking to himself, like, you know, but it's hilarious. Like, we'd be all laughing and like it even, it'd laugh, get a laugh out of Cody because Cody'd be standing there and TJ could come out and raise the ball and he'd be going on and say, yeah, he pops it off to Eddie Kerr. He'd be just making up stuff, like, you know, but it's hilarious. <laughs> it's absolutely hilarious. Like, sure. you know? But he'd be laughing, like, TJ'd be laughing himself, like, he'd be just running around, a bit of playfulness, like, you know, and uh, oh, whatever, but he's, uh, he's a gas ticket now, in fairness, but there's oh, a category. You, you would mention a category <laughs> that has no relevance at all to the play, right? <laughs> yeah. oh, well, you just went... Power, what did you else did you uh, Okay, uh, height, <laughs> height, Joe's taller, right? That's it, <laughs> He's it's like John Henry. I have to mention it. I have to mention this because it reminds yeah. me. John Henry and I, we used to do this thing whereby we just we were doing like a face off mm. of all the different sports. Henry, yeah. like, yeah, I'm way better at basketball than you. <laughs> no, I'm, like, <laughs> I'm way better at shot put than you. And we had this count of all these sports you know what I mean? that were just we didn't play. It was, that's sort of like you know his list. <laughs> oh, yeah. One I'm surprised you didn't use Murph. TJ Reid's got more medals than Kenny. I oh, I, I wouldn't. That's a low that, blow. That, I would have done it. Send it. <laughs> I, know, I, I appreciate what if, you're saying. If you're, going to, if you're going to use height here, that would probably be one you could no, use. No, the question was the case. The question was right. 
it's Joe versus TJ, right? And like, as an individual, okay? Yeah. And okay. the medals is, is a team situation, okay? Kikini are better teams. So it's as simple as that. So that just I, always, I always find, being honest now, it, with any conversation like that, like the conversation turns into, it, it, it loses its point if you start throwing that out because it feels like that you're not strong enough to defend it on basic terms. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, we'll. If we're, yeah, I'm not. I'm not attacking. <laughs> Skelly, you need to calm down. <laughs> we attacking Will. I'm red in the face I'm explaining my point of view. Like, if I was like you were saying, Skelly, now if you were talking to someone there after the game in Turles yesterday, and you were like happy to have the argument or the conversation, I feel if it shuts down the conversation straight away, if you start just you know, oh, who is a better corner back? Like if you were saying Jackie or Ollie Canning. Like let's say for example, lads would say these things, and you and there's great arguments for both of them, both brilliant in their own way. But if you came out and you were like, oh, Jackie has name it, and it, it turns a sour note nearly into the conversation mm-hmm. and it nearly defeats a whole proper conversation as if you're saying that a medal on the table is, you know, if you don't have it, because then you're like, you know, like say Ken McGrath and these lads, like, I mean, yeah. greatest, some of the greatest players ever played the game. Like, you, I think the enjoyment goes out of it. If you're talking about it, it's a great conversation to have TJ or, 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 or Canning or whoever. But um, sometimes when you like, when you throw it down to those things, it nearly kills the thing dead. So uh no, I'd be hesitant to say to say something like that in fairness. So what, what you're saying, Murph, is like Joe was better than TJ. <sighs> never once. Rewind the tape. <laughs> You'll never find it. And I know we'll be sitting in the Borgosh theater and um, something, a snippet will be turned on me, but uh on TJ's camp, TJ's camp here. Don't worry, oh. it's clipped already. So uh, <laughs> I'm on. gonna do hang on, hang on, William. You're not gonna go wait on, to see go you. On. Well, is this going to be like a Homer Simpson type thing where I need a clock in the background to show that it's the, the clips aren't being jumping back and forth? Remember that snippet of <laughs> the snip a sentence together where you're just going to snip a sentence where it sounds like I'm saying Joe's better than TJ. Who's better? I'm asking you, Will. Who's better yeah, I, I think I could be clipped on this because I remember we talked about this, not necessarily as a direct comparison, but back in 2019, we did kind of a decade of sport thing on Off the Ball and... Tommy Walsh and Nick English wrote me, we were kind of chatting through and we picked a 15 of the last decade and so on. And the three of us kind of agreed that probably over the course of that decade, you could argue that TJ Reid was the best hurler in the country. But we also all agreed at the same time, and I don't mean this as a cop-out, that Canning was probably the best hurler of his generation, if that makes sense. As in, TJ's body of work from 2010 to 2019 <coughs> was just incredible. Uh, what he did for both club and county. And TJ's like right up there with Canning. I think this is a proper, you could debate this in a million different ways. But I still, for me, I think Canning was the most talented player of his generation. If we look even over the last, I don't know, 20 years, I think you can make the argument that Canning's the best hurler we've seen in that time. Yeah, I, I also think that TJ has kind of, and it's only in recent times you could say that like he didn't get the credit he deserved because I won't say he's the shadow of Henry, but you know what I mean? Hmm. Like it was, a, it was a big pair of boots to fill now when, when Sheffield left away. But I actually genuinely believe as I think TJ has passed out Sheffield. You know, I know yeah. Shefflin, that's, people say again that again that's a huge call. Like, I mean, again, I think yeah. Shefflin is right up there with Canning as well. You're talking Definitely. about like Rushmore of modern hurling here. Yeah, but I, I, I would think that if I'm going uh, assessing who's the best hurler, let's say I'm having TJ ahead of Shefflin at the moment. Like what he's done has has been ridiculous. And in fairness to TJ, I, I think again, I don't mean this. Whatever way I say this, sounds going to sound bad. Shefflin had a great compliment in cast, a super, super compliment in cast, hmm. and I don't think TJ had it, obviously had because not enough medals in recent times for the Kinney for their liking. I don't think he's had the compliment in cast, you know. So the, 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 the victories that said that Shefflin had had um, was was brought together by Eddie Brennan, by Chad, by all these different lads, where Lord Larkin, etc. Whereas TJ has had to do an awful lot of the body of work himself, which it seems that way. But I like, still like Kinney should have class players, but like I just think like he has been awesome. Do you know what I mean? So I think he's just got ahead of Shefflin. And there's people now who are like historians and they'll say, shut up. Like, you know what I mean? Because Shefflin is... Historians. But, but two, two different type of players, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like Today's game is fast and power. I think TJ has, has transferred through uh, types of generational play, do you know what I mean? So like when he first mm-hmm. came on board, and so was Joel, I say, in, in 08 or 09, there was a type of play. And then it went into the mid you know what I mean? And he's yeah. he's, been, he's been able to be, to be equally effective through them all. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so I just think he's... Got up there. By the way, the other reason I use modern hurling on this one <clears> is <throat> if anyone wants to make the argument, like none of the three of us have seen other than maybe 20 seconds of archive footage of the records and the rings. And mm-hmm. even like I've mm-hmm. only ever seen very limited footage of Eddie Kerr, say like players who were mm-hmm. considered the best ever in their time. I can't make that definition. It'd be like someone oh, saying, okay. like, was De Stefano or Pele better than Messi or Maradona when you just haven't seen as much of them? So yeah. 
obviously all the contemporary reports were that these guys were the absolute best of their time but you just don't know and yeah I think those three are right up there and that's why this debate's kind of fun and that's why this debate would probably even yeah. be more enhanced when there's <coughs> points in hand when it's taking where, place at some point what, what year do you start assessing so like do you, do you go back as far as you know 80 when do you start looking at for me, I, I go to like 95, 96. Yeah, around about that for me as well. Like, we're That's all right. around the same age. I think we're all yeah. watching hurling since the mid-90s, basically. Yeah. Uh, like, religiously, say. Yeah, yeah. And anything okay. else you've seen on GEA gold. And even, yeah. like, from talking to lads that before <laughs> that kind of period in the mid-90s, and even in the mid-90s, there weren't that many games that were televised either. Like, that's one of the things about both Canning and TJ. I think it's this when Canning retired as well, is that... I've never known someone who's been under so much scrutiny because there's far more games on TV now. Even like quite a few of his Pertumna games when he was a teenager because it coincided with Pertumna being the best club side in the country. And sure, look, TJ has been the linchpin of Ballyhale being the best club side of all time. These guys are on performing under the microscope all the time. And we know if they ever have an off game, particularly in Canning's case, Gail, which I always thought was a little bit unfair, was that anytime it didn't work out for Galway, straight away the first piece of analysis would be how did Canning play? Mm. Yeah, like I, I, you know, I, I'm very public about this. In my opinion, is like that, like we, we as group, and I'm including myself completely here, like that, that we just didn't support him enough at times. Like, of course, he has a bad day every now and then, right? But when we, like, every player has bad days, like some more than others. But when we got beaten and he still played well, like he still took all the flack. You know what I mean? Mm. Which I thought was grossly unfair. However, the tr- the trouble is, if you associate Anthony McGovern in terms of victories, they'd always say that, uh, you know, oh, sorry, with defeats. Excuse me. The reason we lost, would say some people would say, "Oh, he didn't do enough." Like that's just bullshit. Like, do you know what I mean we as a team lost lost these games? So it was completely unfair. And I'd say he actually carried that. I, I've never discussed this with him before. I'd say he actually mm-hmm. carried that. He showed that that what's the word I'd use? That, that pressure is that the right word? The yeah, burden, the, 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 the weight, the burden. Great word. The, the the burden of let's say having to having a county on his back. You know what I mean? When when really and truly the rest of us should have been carrying that burden equally. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, you know, and look, it's a weird situation. Maybe we can get into the, this with him at the roadshow when it comes around. But he even said, like, you know, 10 years ago when he made comments about Shefflin, he really felt it was almost like he let the team down by putting this out as a narrative on the week of a game and creating stress around it. But that's kind of the power yeah, that Will, went. He was, he was done there, though. I, I, I would say this straight up. He was done. Like, he was taken completely out of context. Not the whole clip was mm. was printed out. And, you know, that was unfair as well. The way that was that was kind of twisted to, to sound like he was coming at Shefflin. Mm. What's the case? If you read the, if you read the whole thing, like he was actually complimenting their their, their play, how you know they were. I won't call it cynicism, whatever you want to call it, but how they yeah. they went about their business. So. Um, was that actually comments more? Was that was that comment in your dressing room? No? Which, 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 which was, was, was it? Was it one about? Was it wasn't the one about JJ? No, that was before twenty twelve. Remember that was a comment that was that Joe said that JJ said something that Henry put the ball over the bar. Remember the drawn game twenty twelve? That's it. There were, oh, that's the one. Yeah, that is the that's one. The, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, no, I think lads went to JJ. <clears throat> did you say like first of all, lads would think we're saying sure, JJ didn't say that, like you know, and uh, we just didn't believe it. First of all, so I don't think it ever really came up. Like lads were like, yeah. sure, that's we. I think if anything, initially when it came out, we thought that was potentially even the mind games trying to be sent our direction because we were like, when you know a player, you go, sure, obviously you didn't say that, like you know, as in mm. standing beside Joe that JJ said, oh, Henry, why didn't you hang it up in the net, like you know, that wouldn't be JJ style, like you know. So, um, like, yeah. So we, we kind of knew there was it was a, it was a thing in Otten. It didn't co- really come into our dressing room because just the, the p- type of person you knew we were dealing with, like that. Just, yeah, that's, that's, and that's also, interesting though, because Joe sorry. thought in his own head that maybe that created motivation within the Kilkenny dressing room. You're sitting in the Kilkenny dressing room and you say it didn't really have any impact at all. No, because very much our attitude at the time, like JJ in particular, because it was JJ that he was saying that said it. JJ used to be a type of player that would say in the dressing room, like. Let's say if, if if something was happening on the pitch that let's say players weren't marking up, would he be he be telling you win the fucking ball and then give out about it afterwards? Like get onto lads after, but do your job there and then, but don't give out about it while it's happening. You know, do your job, you win the ball, and even if there's two lads there, you know, his attitude is very much of you don't give out, you you work before you give out, like you know, and and though that was kind of the mindset. So when it, it, it almost came across the way that article was written that as if JJ was whinging, which straight away you're going that's not JJ. So we were like, okay, that's maybe either two things. Joe has been taken out of context there or he's trying to fire a shot across the bows with us. But it wasn't It wasn't a, a motivation for us. Like the Leinster final was the motivation for us. And then maybe like, you know, if 
Andy Smith getting up in lads' faces or something. That might have been a bit more of an information. But we just thought this was part of the pantomime of, of coming into a final that either someone's taking out context here or Joe was maybe saying something to us. But we didn't, it wasn't like we were turning up at yokes on the wall and saying training going, look what this lad is saying. Like, you know, it, it didn't actually take much traction in our dressing room. Yeah, two questions I'm going to kick down for the live this coming Sunday. So we're going to go live on Sunday again <coughs> at 8 o'clock after the provincial finals, which should be a really good chat. And I think these might work well after the games for us to talk about. So a bit of homework for the two of you to have a think about. From Sean Lai and Junior Zed Hurler both set this in. And it might be very appropriate on Sunday after we've watched the finals as well. So pick a Munster 15 and a Leinster 15. Uh, don't come back to me with rugby 15s, by the way. You know exactly what I mean on this. <laughs> a selection from both Leinster Hurling Counties and Munster Hurling Counties to play against each other. And we can debate that out with the listeners and the Hurling Pod community at the weekend. And the other one, which I promised to do, but again, it's a little bit kind of longer, which came in from Shane Power, which you can have a think about as well. And the question was, Will, could you discuss the Waterford job again in the preview pod? If you're on about looking for an in-house manager, should we be looking at someone like Sean Power, who won the All-Ireland with the minors in 13 and 21s and 16? He would know the players inside out. Team were phenomenal to watch play, um, so much so with the freedom and the expression that they had in. So, again, I think let's have a think about that, like what you do if you were appointing a Waterford manager, what you'd be looking for, if that was to potentially happen. Uh, it looks at the moment as if Davy Fitz is going to be kept on for a second year. We were just kind of debating that out last week. And just before we go and I say we'll be back at 8 o'clock uh, live on our YouTube and Facebook on Off The Ball on this coming Sunday uh, just a reminder as well hurling is anyone's game Off The Ball teaming up with the Senior Hurling Championship sponsors Borgosh Energy we're uncovering stories highlighting the positive impact that hurling has had on people's lives we've got the competition winner for this week uh, which is hosted by our friends at Borgosh Energy it's Shea Deegan uh, Shea wrote in about his local club committee they're the social slashers uh, they're all about people who turn up every week and contribute to a bit of fun through hurling uh, contributing positively to the local community and helping kids uh, to get involved in the club in both hurling and camogie so all the best to them and congrats to uh, Shay who's getting a goodie bag from Borgosh Energy as well lads it's been an absolute pleasure looking forward to the finals this weekend don't fall out too much over uh, the Leinster final between Galway and Kilkenny and we'll see you at 8 o'clock on Sunday sound lads see you guys for OTB's The Hurling Pod with Borgosh Energy hurling it's anyone's game